How do we make sense of the seeming simplicity of the six days of creation that begin the book of Genesis and therefore the entire Bible? In his book, God is Not Great, the late Christopher Hitchens offered one way, that this book was, quote, written by ignorant men and not by any God, end quote. Man, he explains, is given dominion over all beasts, fowl, and fish. But no dinosaurs or plesiosaurs or pterodactyls are specified because the authors did not know of their existence. For Hitchens, the biblical authors knew next to nothing of what we know today about biological or even cosmic evolution. Therefore, their account was simply wrong. Yet in the early 5th century, one of the greatest figures of the Catholic tradition read Genesis in a way that, today, almost seems like a prophecy of future science. But, unlike Hitchens, his faith in the all-knowing, all-powerful God who inspired Scripture caused him to read longer and closer. St. Augustine of Hippo spent much of his adult life interpreting the book of Genesis. Twice, he wrote commentaries that he found unsatisfactory. On the third try, which took 14 years, he produced a masterpiece on the literal meaning of Genesis. Literal meaning, he explains, means according to the intention of the authors, both the human author and the divine author. Augustine's guiding principle was reverence for God's perfect wisdom. The first creation account has God's creative activity spanning six 24-hour days. But Augustine found this idea to be problematic. If God is perfect, His creative act must also be perfect. It must lack nothing with nature itself ready to do what God intends from the very beginning. And from this vantage point, he noticed something strange and wonderful about the Genesis narrative. Augustine saw a discrepancy in the way God speaks in the account. Sometimes God says, let there be, as he does when he creates light. But in other places, when living things are created, God says, let the sea produce, as he does with fish and birds or let the earth bring forth, as he does with vegetation and with land animals. Earth and sea are allowed by God to produce these creatures. Augustine concludes that this second kind of command refers to living things present as not yet living in the very fabric of the elements. These elements are something like the seeds of life. Under the right circumstances, living beings would emerge from the non-living thanks to God's perfect wisdom and will. All these living things around us, he wrote, have been seminally and primordially created in the texture of the elements, but they require the right occasion to actually emerge into being. One might expect Augustine, who firmly believes human beings to be created in God's image, to stop with the plants and animals, but he doesn't. In the second creation account, we read that God formed man and the animals from the clay of the earth. Augustine concludes that in regard to our bodies, human beings are no exception. The universe brings us forth naturally too. Augustine knew that in human beings, the physical and the spiritual, body and soul, are united in an amazing harmony. Yet he cautions his readers not to forget their humble, 
earthly origins from the clay. But this posed a baffling new problem. How did this happen? Augustine was forced to conclude that somehow, at the beginning, an adult human being sprang from the clay, naturally. He realizes he is on shaky ground, so he defends his answer by writing. We have limited knowledge of nature. Augustine's problem is a scientific one, and the science of his day had nothing to provide. But rather than swivel to a miraculous interpretation, he retained his commitment to both the integrity of creation and the wisdom of the Creator. Inspired by this, St. Thomas Aquinas later wrote that when it comes to nature at its beginning, we must not look for miracles, but for what is in accordance with nature. The missing scientific piece of Augustine's theological puzzle came in the year 1830, exactly 1400 years after his death. It was then that the English geologist Charles Lyell demonstrated the ancient age of the Earth in his Principles of Geology. This book was read by yet another keen observer of nature, Charles Darwin, who hypothesized that all life was produced naturally over millions of years. Many of Darwin's contemporaries looked askance at his idea, as if somehow Darwin was denying the biblical picture of creation. But a Catholic contemporary of Darwin, St. John Henry Newman, knew better. In a private note, Newman writes, it is as strange that monkeys should be so like men with no historical connection between them, as that there should be no course of fact by which fossil bones got into rocks. If we hold out against evolution, Newman concludes, we have to dispense with time and history and declare that God miraculously created fossil-bearing rocks. Newman stood on Augustine's shoulders in his openness to Darwin's great idea. St. Augustine had no idea how nature would produce the human body. Yet he remained confident that the Creator would have a way to ensure that this would happen. And he was right. The Creator did have a way. Modern science calls that way evolution. His careful theological reading of Genesis not only does not conflict with the whole field of evolutionary biology that Darwin founded, it fits it, hand in glove. Both converge on a cosmic process that rises toward humanity as its crowning glory and does so naturally. Thank you.